Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 54. Do you know how a neural network functions? What goes into building one from scratch using Python? This week on the show, David Amos is back, and he's brought another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. David talks about a recent Real Python article titled Python AI How to Build a Neural Network and Make Predictions. This article covers how to train a neural network and create a linear regression model. We also cover several articles about testing in Python, including writing unit tests, testing code in Jupyter Notebooks, and a testing style guide. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including how to build an Asteroids game with Python and Pygame, a five-point framework for Python performance management, how it helps to know a Python programmer if you want a vaccination appointment, a Flask mega tutorial, and the new release of SQL Alchemy. This episode is sponsored by Scout APM. Scout APM is leading edge application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. All right, so we got a couple real Python articles to start off with this week, and one that I haven't really talked about much <laughs> since last year. When I had John Fincher on, and the second episode, we talked about games and we talked about Pi Game. There's a new article on Real Python called "Build an Asteroids Game with Python and Pi Game," and it's by Pavel Fertek. It's really cool. It's it's kind of a fun one. I recently updated my Mac to Big Sur, and I was having a little bit of trouble when I was doing my own course about Pygame with versions of Pygame and getting them to behave well and so forth. And they were in the middle of, I think, <laughs> getting Pygame 2.0 kind of solid. Well, it's pretty solid now. It works pretty well on Mac, at least. It was, uh, you know, I set up a virtual environment, installed it, ran the demo, and it was good to go, which was really nice. and. It was a neat project. It dives pretty deep into, I focused on this a little bit in my interview with John about the idea that games not only are a great way to learn, you know, Python and programming, but as far as learning object oriented programming, they're, they're fantastic for that. And you really are learning this idea of you know, creating different types of objects and spawning them in this case these they change the name which i think is kind of funny with the, to space rocks don't want to you know <laughs> copyright complaint there <laughs> yeah. from atari or whoever owns atari now <laughs> but anyway so it goes into setting up pi game creating the project i liked how the it was kind of set up a little more in a, a project sort of form where you know the initial code is going to be separate from the sort of game launcher, which I, I think is really kind of neat and kind of focuses on that idea of using the if name equal main kind of loop to kind of work with it as far as importing those types of materials. And pretty quickly it gets into, you know, input handling, you know, as far as like movement and, and so forth, uh, dealing with images, you're going to be working with the different objects and kind of figuring out behavior. So, you know, kind of dives a little bit into geometry and the geometry of these objects and the whole idea of these game objects. Then there's one of these kind of interesting things with iGame is that if you don't initially set up a, a clock to kind of control the frame rate, it goes at the fastest speed possible, which can be a little too fast <laughs> with a yeah. lot of modern computers. And so you can kind of, control it back down and get it to like 60 frames or cycles per second. You know, you build the spaceship, you talk about, okay, rotating it, accelerating. A very interesting thing about asteroids is the idea of wrapping around the screen. If you go to the top edge, it'll appear on the bottom edge. So how do you, how do you do that? What's the math involved there? You know, and all, all the way up to, you know, creating the interactions with the bullets and 
interesting, unique things that are to the asteroids type game where you're splitting them up into smaller objects and then working with sounds and kind of ending the game. They don't want to go on forever. <laughs> so there are things that are really nice jumping off points to polish it more. The idea of like scoring, right? Uh, really controlling the speed a little bit more. Uh, if you remember Asteroids Deluxe, I believe that was the one that actually had a shield, sort of shield button. So that might be something fun to do. Controlling with a joystick instead of using the the keyboard, though I guess the keyboard is very much like the arcade cabinet would be <laughs> as far as the individual buttons. Yeah. But anyway, it's, it's a really neat project. It's it's very detailed. I enjoyed you know playing around in the code and, and, and working with it. And it's a really good good way to get into Python and playing around in Pygame. Yeah, so this is a, a really cool example of this new format, which I think we've maybe talked about one, yeah. maybe two other ones on the podcast, but it's a step-by-step project, which you can always tell on real Python when it's a step-by-step project because it starts with like build a or build and, you know, and then something that you're building. So it's, it walks you through literally step-by-step. The headings are, are like step one and do something, step two, do something. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that's a really neat format. And, you know, I think a lot of people appreciate taking the concepts they've learned from, you know, our more educational type articles and really building something with it. So, uh, and this one is really fun. As you, as you said, it's got some really cool, you know, graphics and, and stuff that, uh, that come with it. And I think even, even has sounds yep. uh, with it as well. And it was something that the Powell actually approached us with. He had used, so he's kind of reusing something he'd already built before that he'd done I guess he'd given some talks at some PyLadies meetups over in, I think he's in Germany. Yeah, so it's it's a really fun, fun project. It's another example of the step-by-step project format, which I'm, I'm excited to have more of these come out and we've got more of them in the pipeline. So if you like these style of, of tutorials, then um, there's more coming. Yeah, I just noticed on his uh, personal page here, uh, not only that he's living in Berlin, but he has a game development sort of company. I'm going to... Oh, does he? I didn't know that. Try it here. Miskatonic Mis- Studio is what it called, and there's a link for it. And there's two projects in there, one called Intrepid and another one that's using Godot or Godot, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, Open Adventure Template, which is something that actually John mentioned also, which is... Oh, cool. Kind of cool, yeah. So again, a neat way to kind of dive into that and... Um, check it out i'll I'll include links to his his stuff there but you can get to it from the article too yeah i'm excited by all this uh, you know updates to creating more step-by-step stuff and i really feel like it's giving people an opportunity to to build on top of it you know give you enough of a framework and you know of course right as we always mentioned that you can get the code from the the github repository if if you need that to kind of help you kind of keep going with it so what's your first one I've got another real Python article. This one comes from a brand new team member, Deborah Mesquita. It's called Python AI, how to build a neural network and make predictions. And this is a cool article because it walks you through building a neural network from scratch. So not using any, you know, pre-built thing like from Scikit or from, you know, PyTorch or anything okay. like that, which is not something you know, I, I think when you're working in the real world, you know, you usually wouldn't build something like this from scratch. But if you're trying to learn about neural networks and, and understand how they work, then doing something like this is a great way to to do that because you really get to see, you know, how everything is tied together and how it works from the inside out. This is going to be part of a new learning path that we're putting together on neural networks. So this will kind of be your introduction to how neural networks work with kind of the main concepts are and then getting some practice actually building one so that you can implement the the concepts that you're uh, you know that you're learning and yeah she she walks you through kind of an overview of what art artificial intelligence is and kind of what it isn't and, and then the different kinds of artificial intelligence and then how neural networks fit into that some of the main concepts around neural networks and the process of training them, things like linear regression and how that fits into it. And then, yeah, you start building your first neural network. So, and then at the end, you actually train it 
and use it to come up with a with a prediction. And it's, you know, it's a really, I hate to use the word simple, but it's, you know, simple as in the opposite of complex, I guess here. It really is a simple uh, neural network. I think it only has one layer. Uh, so if you're, if you're familiar with neural networks, they have these different layers to them. This one just has a single layer and it really guides you through, you know, how all this works, a little bit of the math involved. It doesn't get too much into, into the math, but, but it's linked to a whole bunch of resources. If you want to dive deeper into the math, you can, but yeah, it's just a really great introduction. I'm excited to have, I did the technical review for this. I really enjoyed it. I'm excited to have Deborah on the team and, and excited to see what else that she comes out with here for us. Yeah, I'm excited by a lot of this new data science stuff that we're kind of adding as we go. Um, I have a course that's coming through that's um, about NLP. It is actually kind of a neat, neat one. It kind of goes into the Keras framework. Yeah. And you know, does a bit of sentiment analysis, which we had Kyle on the show to talk about his article. That was another one that was about sentiment analysis also. So it's, it's kind of fun. We're kind of diving a little further into that. And then I was doing the review on it. So I learned a lot more about the process there. And um, that one, again, kind of is, there's so much depth <laughs> as far as, you know, learning something like, um, you know, creating the neural network and then building layers and all these kind of different steps that are in there. So yeah, anything to kind of get you in and then giving you additional resources, I think is fantastic to like get you on the path where like, okay, if you want to dive further in, here's you know where you can kind of go. There's only so much you're going to fit in one article <laughs> without it becoming a book as we've mentioned before. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Scout APM is leading edge application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues at only $39 a month. Scout APM pinpoints and resolves performance abnormalities like N plus one queries, memory bloat, and more. So you can spend less time debugging and more time building a great product. With a developer-centric UI and tracing logic that ties bottlenecks to source code, get the insights you need in less than four minutes without dealing with the headache or overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. And with Scout APM's real-time alerting and weekly digest emails, you can rest easy knowing Scout's on watch to help you resolve performance issues before your customers ever see them. Start your free 14-day trial today. And as an added bonus for Real Python listeners, Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. Check it out at scoutapm.com slash realpython. At this point, we're going to kind of dive into... Uh, a, a fairly deep topic on uh, testing and it's kind of neat because I've actually recorded a episode in advance here. Um, a new episode will be coming out soon with the team from sorcery.ai and it's all about refactoring. And in that process of refactoring, that's really important that you've set up all this sort of testing in advance. So you know that if you're going to change your code that <laughs> you haven't, change it in a way that's broken it and having tests and unit tests and things like in place to make sure that that goes smoothly is, is really critical. And inside of PyCoders this week, there were like, I don't know, three or four different resources all about testing. And one was from Miguel Grinberg. And if you're not familiar with him, he, I'll mention another thing about him later, which is uh, he created this Flask mega tutorial, which is pretty famous in, in our community. And we'll talk a little more about that later. Yeah, but he's got started a series and it's called how to write unit tests in Python. And it's part one. And he took a very common interview type question. He keeps calling it a game, which I think is interesting. He calls it, you know, the, the fizz buzz game. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with it, you know, you're presented in an interview fairly often with this idea, like, okay, if you have a set up a range of numbers from one to a hundred, have it print them out. But, Whenever there's something that's divisible by three, it should print fizz. If it's divisible by five, it should print buzz. If it's divisible by both or by 15 or some kind of iteration of that, then it should be fizz buzz. And, and otherwise it would print the actual number. And so it's kind of a neat thing to create a test around. It's very, it's something you could hold in your head, which is something also we talk a lot about when we were diving into this idea of refactoring and, idea of like okay you know can you think about this you know how complex is it 
And so he starts out with a whole section, you know, kind of a small section about why do we test things and then the types of tests, um, integration versus functional versus unit testing. And unit tests are really evaluating individual pieces of your code in isolation to confirm that they actually work as expected. Whereas a functional test is really going to be at the end of the whole deal. It does the whole project function as planned. And then integration is where you might be tying kind of somewhere in between the two, evaluating that two or more modules confirm that they actually work together as a group and they get the exact output you're expecting. So in taking this FizzBuzz application and initially it's just like a script. And so he very quickly identified that, okay, you're going to need to turn this into a function. And part of the reasoning for that is in order to do testing, at least in sort of frameworks like PyTest or even very often something like unit test, you're going to want to be able to load that code in as a module and be able to run it independently. And if it's running just as a straight script, then it would execute the code every time. And in this case, you would create one of those main functions where, you know, if name equals main, that sort of structure that you've seen very often. And the advantage to that is that then as you import the code, it will not run the main part of it. Right. And then it dives pretty deep into working with PyTest and creating tests for each one of these situations, which I mentioned earlier, the fizz, the buzz, and the fizz buzz. Yeah. <laughs> and then he gets into how many things you should test for, um, how sort of deep do you need to get into it. But then he starts to talk a little bit more about coverage, the idea of testing coverage in looking through the code and one nice advantage of something like PyTest is there's additional sort of frameworks inside there that help you actually measure it and it will give you line numbers, you know, saying, okay, this is covered, this isn't covered. This is actually something I talked with when I had Anthony Shaw on and we did this sort of deep dive into getting started with testing and he was talking about coverage also. And the advantage here is you can very quickly see with the small program, okay, it's covering those situations, but what about if it's a regular number? Okay, well, that's a percentage of your program that's not covered. So you need to go, okay, we'll need to have a test case for that and so forth. And then the last thing was, uh, again, kind of diving into coverage, the actual name equals main, that structure isn't something that would normally be tested kind of the same way as far as like finding a result. And since it's more just like sort of structural, you know, to be able to make it work the way we want it to talks about adding what's called a pragma sort of comment inside of there. And what that will do is identify to the coverage tool that this is something that's, you know, can be skipped as far as testing is concerned that we understand, you know, what's going on with it and how it functions. But it's a really good introduction to testing, really kind of quick and easy to walk through. You get to practice with PyTest. So it's a good resource. And I feel like if you haven't started testing, this is a neat, neat way to start. And like I said, we're going to talk a little more <laughs> on testing as we go uh, in a few other situations. So, yeah, it's a good, it's a very comprehensive article or, well, comprehensive introduction, I guess. Yeah. It's not comprehensive. Like it doesn't cover everything. Yeah. I'm wondering what the next parts are going to be. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I wonder if he's going to do another kind of flask mega tutorial style thing on, a, <laughs> yeah, totally. on testing. But it's a really great introduction, I, I thought. You know, that really, you know, this FizzBuzz isn't really a, I wouldn't call it an application. It's something that is like a, like a, like a, a, a question you would see like on an interview, like a kind of right. this idea, but, um, but it still gives you something concrete to work with and that isn't like trivial. And I think that's something that in a lot of the like testing tutorials I've seen or, you know, where there's like introduction to PyTest they'll use like a very, I mean, trivial can kind of be a dirty word, I guess, but, you know, something that just doesn't have a lot of depth to it or a lot of like cases that things right. that are variable. Yeah. yeah. And so the fizz buzz kind of gives you something where like, there's, there's kind of a lot to test there. So, so you really kind of get a nice introduction to like the different things you're looking for and, and things like that. So yeah, it's a really great, great article, which is to be expected coming from Miguel. Yeah. So what do you got next? Mine kind of fits into this testing picture as well. It's it's a little bit different perspective. It's it's focused on performance testing. It's it's an article from Stephen F. Lott called "A Five Point Framework for Python Performance Management." Stephen 
uh, works for Capital One, I believe. It's it's published on the Capital One Tech blog on Medium. It's a free Medium article, so if you don't, you know, it won't affect your monthly totals or whatever. Your, which is, your count. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a really fantastic article. I really like this one a lot. It's uh, it's really well written, really well thought out, and it's got a really interesting and unique perspective on this. So he th- sort of the subtitle of this says performance testing like sailboat racing depends on the conditions along the race course. Now, I don't know anything about sailboat racing, but um, but it was intriguing enough for me to go, oh, okay, I want to I want to know more about this. Apparently Steven used to live on a boat and he talks about, you know, one of the questions that comes up when you live on a boat or you're talking to people about boats, they're like, well, how fast does it go? Well, he lived on a <laughs> sailboat. Right. Right. So no, no motor. And he would, you know, say that it's, it's not that I wanted to be evasive when answering this, but measuring performance is nuanced. There's no simple, it goes this fast for boats, nor is there one when writing software in Python. When we add libraries like NumPy and Dask into the mix, what are we really measuring? What should we be measuring? And he has this really, I want to read uh, a couple sentences from this paragraph, because this is really where I kind of got hooked into the the article and was like, okay, I've got to read read more. He says, I want to suggest that Python's performance, like a boat, is intimately tied to configuration choices, i.e. sails, in specific use cases, i.e. wind direction. Further, I want to suggest that questions about volume of data and scalability are also important and sometimes overlooked. Additionally, we should consider asking about simplicity and maintainability. When looking at Python, we have to be cognizant of Python as a package deal. It starts with a low barrier to entry and navigates through an easy-to-use language and folds in a rich library of add-on packages. Narrowing the conversation to only talking about performance can miss the additional benefits of a language like Python. So he really gets into thinking about, you know, what are the are the performance goals and how it really it really depends on the kind of application you're you're working on and and he kind of gives this example of like you know for a small sailboat it does kind of make sense to talk about you know speed or or things like that uh speed and maneuverability but for a big sailboat the question isn't really like how fast can it go but performance is measured more in like well how far can it go so it's it's a different question it's about like the destination and not the not the speed. And so you kind of have to have this separation as well for for Python applications. So the framework that he has put together, I'll just summarize it. I'll just summarize it in the the, the five steps that he's put together and then if you're interested you can go read uh, the rest of the article, but he was, you know, he wanted something that was reproducible and something that you could you know, kind of quickly get set up when you're working on a new new uh, project. And uh, it starts with number one. So these are the five points. Number one is to define the use cases and the performance targets. And number two is to codify performance targets into Gherkin. So Gherkin is a is a is a, a framework for for testing that uses this uh, given win then kind of kind of language. Mm. And you don't have to use Gherkin. I mean, he's chosen it in this framework that he's put together. But Gherkin is like a language that you can you can write your test cases in and it uses like you know given some conditions when something occurs then and this outcome is expected is kind of the this gherkin language and he chooses that just because he likes that given when then framework is like you know a, a nice way to sort of write out your your test cases and in these cases or in this instance we're talking about you know performance testing so but this could be used with any kind of testing once you've sort of codified your performance targets and you know at this point you haven't implemented anything in python it's it's really just codification it's just writing out specific test cases then the next step is to review with the product owners to be sure they understand how gherkin describes the user experience so you get a little bit of you know feedback a chance to share okay this is what we're testing these are the targets we've set and you know, it gives the the product owners a chance to come back and say that, yes, they like that, or no, have you considered this, or we really don't care about that, or, you know, there's, it allows you to open up that conversation before you ever even start programming anything. Once you've done that, then the fourth step is to actually program it and implement it in Python. And 
he kind of has a, a tool agnostic approach there. He doesn't really suggest a specific tool to use, but, but, you know, the point is that now you go and actually implement the, the test in Python. And then the fifth part of it is to make your performance testing part of your CI CD pipeline, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. So those are kind of, that's kind of the, the framework for that. And, uh, he goes into a lot of detail, uh, into each of those different points in the, in the, in the five point framework. If you're into this kind of stuff, I, I really suggest you read this article. It really is uh, extremely well written and, and well thought out and uh, very enjoyable read. So good stuff. Nice. Yeah. Anything where they're helping to provide the, the sort of, you know, additional framework of like, okay, well, how are we testing? What are we testing? And, and kind of providing these unique set of metrics, I think is useful because there's so many different, we've talked a lot about how Python is such a universal language in a lot of ways. It can be used in so many different cases that the performance is going to be very different depending on, you know, if it involves an API or other types of frameworks like that, or if you're dealing with different types of large data. And so I can, I, I can completely see where he, what he's talking about with these different metaphor of the boats <laughs> kind of right. Yeah. Tying into that, the manu- maneuverability and all those kinds of things that you would think about. My next one is talking about testing again. And in this case, it's talking about unit testing Python code in Jupyter notebooks. And this one is by Matt Wright spelled with a W and his blog is uh, writers.io blog again with W <laughs> like the Wright brothers. Yeah. And the subtitle that, that you guys created here is even if you code in Jupyter notebooks, there's no excuse to not be testing your code. Yeah. And I have to agree with that. The, the idea that, you know, I think we had that summary of all the different uh, Jupyter notebooks that are out there and the idea that, a lot of them didn't run all the way through and that they're really just sort of a, almost a scratch pad and so forth. But very often notebooks are going to be used within an organization and be set up in a way that, you know, they, they would be reused by lots of different individuals. And it's like, okay, well, how do I test my code in that situation? So they right. presented um, three different kind of plans uh, that you can kind of look at for doing it. One probably the clunkiest, which would be to copy the code out and put it into like an IDE with a set of files and yeah. use PyTest to confirm testing, kind of going back to like what we were discussing uh, in Miguel's uh, article earlier. And then the other idea would be to use something like unit test within the same notebook, but have like separate sort of testing cells, which is kind of an interesting idea. And then one that came up that that I was somewhat familiar with, um, there's a really good tutorial that we had a little while ago that was kind of tackling the idea of passing interviews, uh, Python interviews. And they covered the idea of using doc test, which is a really neat interactive tool that's built into Python. And the doc test module searches for pieces of text that look like interactive Python sessions. So like inside your doc string below you know, where you're defining a particular function, you include these strings uh, that look like, you know, if you were working inside of Python REPL with the the prompt the same way with the three sort of angle bracket, <laughs> things kind of pointing it out. And anyway, so I'm going to include a link to doc test on um, the Python documentation um, so you can learn a little more about it. And there's some good examples inside of the Python documentation for it also. And then, so he gives ideas that you could actually create that inside of the cells there and then test using that. And I thought, okay, that's a really smart way to kind of do it. And then it's also providing these test cases and examples inside of it, which I think is really kind of smart too. So yeah. the third one, kind of diving a little deeper in it, is a, a tool called Test Book, which is a, a unit test framework that, that's sort of an extension for testing code inside of Jupyter Notebooks. And in that case, you kind of are setting up, again, a separate file. But in this case, it's bringing in the code from your Jupyter Notebook. It knows how to read that information and pull it in. And it can then kind of go through. And then in that particular case, you can use unit test or PyTest, uh, whatever your favorite is for, for working with it. And so I think that might be a really handy tool, especially if there's lots of existing stuff or you don't want to necessarily, maybe you're testing somebody else's code would allow you to kind of set it up uh, separately and be able to import in and, and test 
kind of somewhat independently, which is a neat way to do it. So three different kind of potential solutions for updating your Jupyter notebooks to uh, have testing <laughs> inside of them, which I think are kind of neat. And then I, I wanted to mention another link that is actually from previous guest. Uh, we had the uh, Stargirl Flowers on. Uh, she was a guest on episode five mm -hmm. and she has a blog blog.thea.codes and she has created a thing called the python testing style guide on there and it's really kind of not a super deep dive into actual testing but more of a way to introduce you to kind of the stylistic components there like how should i name things what is the terminology that should be used? How should I name the functions and classes and so forth? Yeah. Which I think is really great. It talks about how you should be setting up asserts um, as far as the results and what the outcomes that are expected. Thinking about how to use mocks and what sort of specs that you're looking for, for the those to be created inside of that. And then just kind of dives into all those little concepts. And she she's created some additional tools that are all linked to also there's a tool that's out there called Knox that I think is kind of neat mm -hmm. uh, as far as like going back into the CI CD, you know, topic that you were just mentioning. So another good resource on testing that also was uh, inside of the Pi coders this week. And I don't want to neglect to mention it because it's, it's a good an additional one that can help you at least get, you know, again, some best practices and techniques for uh, getting into testing a little bit more. Yeah. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It covers the type of Python skills you need to practice to stand out from the competition. It's titled Python Coding Interviews, Tips and Best Practices. The course is based on a real Python article by James Timmons. And in the course, James Weigio takes you through how to use enumerate to iterate over both indices and values, how to debug problematic code with breakpoint, how to format strings effectively with F strings sorting lists with custom arguments, using generators instead of list comprehensions to conserve memory, defining default values when looking up dictionary keys, counting hashable objects with the collections counter class, and use the standard library to get lists of permutations and combinations. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn the types of skills that will showcase your knowledge of the Python language. And like most of the video courses on real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code examples for the technique shown. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So what do you got next? So the next one I've got is a little bit different. It's not a technical article. It's not even really about Python, although it does talk about Python programmers. And it's from NBC News, which is not okay. a typical <laughs> source that we have. Not one of our resources, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, was, um, but it was an interesting article, and it's relevant to the times with the vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, being rolled out across the U.S. and other, and other countries. You know, you have to get an appointment, and that can be very challenging. So the, the, the title of the article is Want a Vaccine Appointment? It Helps to Know a Python Programmer. The subtitle says programmers have figured out ways to help family and friends gain an edge in getting vaccine appointments, but they also realize not everybody has that advantage. So I was interesting to see this in, you know, in something like NBC News, like this, uh, you know, large mainstream news thing. And it, it, it's a pretty short article. It just, you know, it doesn't, go into a lot of depth and stuff, but it brings up some points that we've talked about in the past as far as, you know, scraping websites yeah. uh, goes. But I mean, kind of the, the the premise here is that the vaccine appointment websites are all government run. And, you know, for better or for worse, that I'll just say government websites don't always have the best track record of being the best user experience or being particularly easy to use. And one of the problems with that is that a lot of the the people that are eligible for vaccines right now are elderly people, and they have a very hard time using these websites. They get frustrated because, you know, appointments are going very quickly, and it it just causes un, unnecessary anxiety and stress for some of these folks. So there have been people that are using Python that are, you know, scraping these websites and finding a, available appointments and alerting 
people to them, or they're just, you know, not on a large scale basis. It's just, you know, someone happens to be a, a Python programmer and they know how to do all this and they want to help their grandma get, you know, get a vaccine appointment. So they write a quick little script and run it and they're like, Oh, I got you one here. Let's just go ahead and, and get you signed up real quick. And it's a, it's neat to see that, but there are obviously some, some issues with that. There's, you know, some ethical could be some potential ethical issues. If, if things are being abused, like people who are not necessarily eligible are using it to sort of skip, skip ahead in line or, or things like that. But also the issue of, uh, sort of accidentally DDoSing these, these sites, you know, just overloading them with, with traffic. If you're not uh, careful with how you've written your, your scraper. And so there's some things, you know, to, to consider there. And, and it talks about, you know, some people that, uh, you know, they're aware of this. They interview one person, his name is Matt Hens, who's an IT engineer in Austin. And he says, I've had multiple discussions with friends who have run it or are running it, referring to some kind of scraper to get these vaccinations. He says, you think about morally, is this okay? My thoughts on the whole thing is if you're signing up people who legitimately are eligible, I don't see a problem with it. Whether you're 70 and run it or 70 and can't run it, you're eligible and I have the skills to do this. So I'm going to help uh, people out. And they also talk to a lawyer who says, you know, scraping data from public facing servers that aren't using any kind of authentication protocols, like usernames or passwords, then, you know, that that's fine. There's generally a recognition that data scraping is a huge component of our economy. We depend on it for price information, for news, things like that. So, you know, the question of is this okay seems to be like, look, if if you're genuinely helping people that need this and are eligible, then yes, it's it's okay. But you know, please be respectful of uh, of the sites. Don't overload them with traffic. Yeah, and and don't abuse the power that you have uh, to do this to you know help people like skip in line or or things like that. But anyways. It was a timely and relevant and interesting uh, discussion. And, our, and here we are, a real world application of uh, web scraping yeah. uh, that has a, a big impact on on people's lives. Yep. And a sort of thought provoking about the ethics of, of it at the same time again. Yeah. Cool. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to projects. And as I alluded to earlier, I was <laughs> very interested because uh, this is a project that I actually I did myself back when I was just starting with Python and wanting to get on at on a team that was looking for a Python programmer and potentially somebody who's going to be doing stuff with Docker and um, Flask and creating these kind of little resources. I stumbled across Miguel's tutorial, the Flask Mega Tutorial, as it's called. He's rewritten it a couple times. It, it the most recent revision was in 2017, and then shortly after that. It's actually turned into a whole course. So if you want like a video version of it, that's something you could purchase. But the Flask Mega Tutorial as stands is a 23 part, <laughs> again, mega tutorial to kind of diving really deep into not only setting up Flask. Um, I'll read some of the chapters. I mean, it obviously starts with like just getting set up with like a hello world, but then it dives to templates, web forms, setting up the database, creating user logins, profile page and avatars, dealing with errors, creating management for followers, pagination, email support for things like resetting passwords and so forth. Yeah. You know, creating a facelift on it to, I think, apply something like bootstrap, if I remember right, dates and times, uh, working with Ajax, uh, restructuring and refactoring it, uh, looking at it, uh, deploying with full text search, which is pretty advanced. And then deployment in Linux, I actually was able to practice with the deployment on Heroku, um, deployment using Docker containers, and then it goes all the way up. And then he's act actually added a couple new things with user notifications and um, an API uh, at the very end of it. So it's really detailed. His blog has also got a lot of other really useful kind of things on it. I mean, obviously we talked about the testing thing earlier, but uh, it's a good resource, and so if you are interested, and you're kind of building this, I don't know, I, I want to call it a Twitter-like clone, but it's something like that, a messaging app. And mm -hmm. I uh, was interested in trying to get uh, Rivers Cuomo, who's a singer from Weezer, to try to get him to come on the show. I'm, I'm still working on that. Um, 
but he had created a uh, <laughs> sort of a chat room kind of tool that really reminded me of this in a way. It's it's different in some ways, but I was like, okay, this is definitely a flask kind of thing. I wonder if he had read Miguel's you know Grinberg's <laughs> tutorial on this. Anyway, so his uh, his site is like Mr. Rivers Neighborhood, if you're interested in checking it out. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I was able to chat with him a little bit, but I think the new album came out. And so I was kind of lost my chance to get in there. So I'll, I'll see if I can still try to get him on. I'd like to talk to him just about being a musician and getting into programming. And so we'll see. Yeah. Anyway, and so how did I you know, kind of like figure out, well, he he's actually... Uh, He's got a GitHub repository and he's sponsoring Miguel's oh, gotcha. uh, GitHub. And so I was like, okay, I think this <laughs> putting two and two together anyway. So uh, a really great project, a really great way to kind of get into, you know, deep dive into Flask and learning more about what you can do inside of it. Um, if you want to learn more or practice your, your skills and uh, setting up a real world kind of thing, it was fun. Cause again, when I was applying for that job to be able to show, People say, like, okay, go to this web address, sign up, make an account, and so forth. It was it was a really kind of fun and then interactive way, you know, after I'd done like this initial sort of conversation with these people to be able to show them like this is a project that I'm working on and, and kind of playing around in, which was a, a kind of a neat way to kind of, you know, showcase some of my skills and the idea of hosting and stuff, these common concepts that we've covered in the show. So anyway. Yeah. So what do you got this week for projects? Mine is, uh, it kind of ties in nicely to this whole flask thing, actually, because uh, this is a, all about SQL alchemy, which yeah. is uh, an ORM, an object relational mapper that connects a database to Python objects. That, so you can use them in like a more, you know, object type fashion rather than writing out raw SQL. You know, if you use Django, Django has its own ORM, the Django ORM. But if you use flask, I know SQL alchemy is you know, probably the most popular yeah. ORM that gets used uh, with that. Well, they just released back on March 15th, their, the next uh, release, which is 1.4.0. Uh, and it is, they describe it as the most extensive release for SQL Alchemy in at least 10 years, featuring a major rethink of the most prominent APIs in core and ORM and vastly revised internals and a wide range of significant new features and capabilities. So it's a, it's a really big uh, release. The goal of 1.4 is to establish itself as the starting point for the SQL Alchemy 2.0 project, which will move fully to Python 3. So they're going to drop Python 2 support okay. completely, as well as finalize new APIs that are introduced in 1.4.0. So if... You know, it, it kind of sounds like it's it's going to be a little bit of a split. Like, you know, if you're starting a new project, you might consider using 1.4. It sounds like maybe you don't necessarily want to upgrade yet. If you're, you know, on uh, one previous to 1.4, you'll have to look at the the advantages and disadvantages there. But it's got a lot of really, really cool new things in it. So there is a whole new approach that they're using to generate select and other SQL statements that are all, it's everything is kind of being unified around a new uh, select function and a new construct they've got there. So that is uh, kind of a big deal. They've got a, a new revised declarative mapping system, which uh, now supports Python data classes, which is another big, big deal. Let's see, they're adding support now, uh, complete support now for async IO, which again is another big deal. And they've also added native support for type hints and uh, MyPy, or actually it says native support for type hints and MyPy are now underway with the first alpha version of all new MyPy plugin, of an all new MyPy plugin included, which operates with a newly published stubs library called SQL Alchemy 2 stubs. So, Lots of big things, and that's only like four or three or four, whatever, however many I just said, yeah. out of <laughs> like big, big, big list, list yeah. of like big changes that they're uh, that they're making. So, yeah, it's a really big, really big release. Lots of changes, and it sounds like a you know kind of an exciting time for SQL Alchemy that they're they're really getting a chance to embrace a lot of the new features that Python has added recently, and finally make that uh, transition to fully embracing. Python three. Yeah. So yeah, big stuff. Been super busy 
I mean, if you look at the latest news kind of thing on the sidebar there, it's like, okay, Monday, the 15th, we release 1.40. Wednesday, the 17th, we release 1.4.1. <laughs> Friday, <laughs> yeah, 1.4.2. And then just, just uh, yesterday, Thursday, yeah, 1.4.3. So it's moving pretty rapidly, which is good to see. I mean, obviously there's, you know, squishing bugs and figuring out ways to right, enhance yeah. those things. But uh, yeah, a neat place to kind of learn a little more about that project. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, in the Flask community, SQL Alchemy is a crucial tool. So that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for bringing in all these articles and projects to my attention again. Absolutely. Thanks for hanging out. All right. I'll talk to you soon. See ya. Don't forget... You can start your free 14-day trial today. And as an added bonus for Real Python listeners, Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. That's scoutapm.com slash realpython. I want to thank David Amos for coming on the show again. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.